Excellent. Okay. Can everyone, well, I hope everyone can hear me now. I was having some mouse related issues with my unmuting function. So uh, my name is Robert Gropp and I'm with AIBS and I am simply here to welcome everyone and, and share our appreciation for you taking the time to join us today for what we think is a very timely and important um, discussion about some issues that face the future of science, uh, most notably through um, aspects about scientific societies and the professional community. And incredibly vital and, and vibrant and important to the future conduct of, of science um, and building the communities that we need to share information and to support discovery and education and, and all those things that everyone I'm, I'm confident on this program um, holds so, so dear and valuable are in, in periods of transition and are needing to consider what um, opportunities are available and the best way to have impact, the best way to serve members, the best way to, to help continue to drive science forward. And so we're very thrilled to have this program today. This is part of um, a new program that AIBS has launched this year that we are calling Topics in Leadership and Biology. It's a series of both in-person as well as, as online and, and webinar um, programs on a monthly basis, um, really that, that help us do what we, what we like to do, which is to try to provide leadership and share information that helps inform decision making. And so for those of you that are, are not that familiar with AIBS, we are a scientific organization and we are supported and sustained in part by um, the support of individual and institutional members. And we have over 150 institutional members representing the breadth of the biological sciences. And um, we are very thrilled to, to have them and welcome additional engagement, support, and, and partnership opportunities with, with them and other parts of the scientific community. So with all that, I encourage you to, to um, visit our website to learn more about us or to, to sign up for future programs. We have a program next month um, in October that is going to continue to explore issues that we've been, we've been working on lately in terms of um, conducting research on peer review and the merit review process and what do we actually know about, about it, how, what can we quantify about it that works well or that, that might need some improvement and, and just better, better understanding of the process that we all um, engage in so routinely to, to press science forward. So again, that information is on our, our website AIBS.org. I, I hope that you'll take a few minutes to visit the site and to register for a future program. And with that, I will conclude my remarks and turn it back to Diane, who will um, provide some guidance and, and instructions for, for how the program will, will operate today. So once again, thank you very much. Thank you, Rob. Um, again, my name is Diane Bossenjack. I will be your support contact during this webinar. A quick reminder, this meeting is be re being recorded for archival purposes. We ask that you mute your microphones and turn off your video stream to help uh, minimize any connection issues or audio feedback that might occur. You will see in the far left-hand corner of your Zoom screen an icon for your microphone and video, each the line through it. If you don't see the line through either one of them, that means you are not muted or your video is not turned off, but everybody seems to be good right now. But if you do, have, if you do not see the line, um, if you click on that icon, it will turn it off. Um, if you are joining via phone, you can mute your phone by dialing star six. If you have any questions or issues, please use the chat feature below and someone from AIBS will assist you. There will be a Q&A session at the end of the webinar. To ask a question, please type in your question into the chat feature and someone from AIBS will relay your question to the presenter. Again, thanks for joining today's webinar. I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Sherry Potter. Thank you, Diane, and thank you, Rob, for introducing this presentation today. And thank you to everyone who's joining us for this important and timely topic. The original title of this presentation was Scientific Societies Preparing for the Future. But so many of these changes are happening right now and have been happening for several years that I've altered the title, Scientific Societies, The Future is Now. My name is Sherry Potter, and I am the Director of Membership and Programs, Public Programs at the American Institute of Biological Sciences an organization that was created in 1947 to bring together of biology and address challenges that affect the broad practice of the life sciences and serving its professionals and society. 
a mission that is particularly apropos today because we are in a time in which there are many changes to the broad practice of the biological sciences that are taking place. In the words of Joseph Travis pictured here from Florida State University and as AIBS president both today and in 2010 when he wrote this, scientists love dynamic environments. After all, the goal of the scientific enterprise is to constantly improve how we understand and describe our world. We thrive on new insights, and most of us would be bored to tears where we denied the thrill of discovery and change. Nonetheless, we scientists often struggle to keep up with some changes. In particular, the goals of the scientific enterprise are not changing. Understanding this dynamic and embarking upon many years of research, uh, as a result, AIBS has launched a new initiative, as Rob described, the Leadership in Biology Initiative. It aims to catalyze advances in science, strengthen the profession, and bring information to decision makers. We've created a series of online and in-person events that will address emerging opportunities and challenges in data sharing, foster improved understanding of peer review, policy development and advocacy, capacity building for scientific organizations, and exploration of new career pathways. Coming up in this series, as Rob mentioned, our next webinar is October 15th. Evaluating Merit Review will be hosted by Dr. Stephen Gallo from our Scientific Peer Advisory and Review Services Divisions. He's going to investigate conflicts and bias in peer review. Next, we're hosting an in-person all-day event in Washington, D.C. on December 8th, addressing biological informatics workforce needs. We hope all societies will send a representative to that event. And then in late December, early January, we're running a series of poly, policy webinars that will inform people about policy changes happening in 2016 and a look at the, the fiscal budget for 2017 for research and discovery. But today's topic is how are scholarly societies impacted by this dynamic environment in which we are finding ourselves today? Anecdotal Data in 2010 launched a research initiative in which we explored how the changing dynamics of science were affecting the community its practice, infrastructure, and integrity. My presentation today is a synthesis from these multiple data and information sources. We surveyed biology organizations. With 110 respondents, we were able to report what is important to biological societies at the start of the 21st century. We surveyed individual professionals and students. With over 4,300 respondents, we were able to communicate what professionals are looking for from their relationship with scholarly societies. We conducted a focus group type conversation where we brought together postdoctoral scholars, graduate students, early, mid, and late career professionals to examine societies from across generations. And we created a database capturing 20 fields of data on more than 200 organizations that serve biological sciences to find out how the membership uh, patterns are shifting among these organizations today. And finally, we did some exploratory interviews. Our board of directors interviewed 50 leaders in the field to find out what their opinions were about the opportunities and challenges that we face today and the transformations in practice that are required in order to move our science forward. Because of the pathway that this research took, this presentation very naturally weaves together the story of both scholarly societies as organizations that fulfill critical roles in direct service to science, while also talking about their role as stakeholders in the leadership challenges that are inherent to the scientific endeavor. By the end of this presentation, I strive to leave you with three takeaway messages. Number one, scholarly societies are a rich and vital part of the scientific endeavor. They provide direct service for professionals in a way that no other organization provides, and technology will never provide. In addition, science is a human enterprise with a significant social mission Scholarly societies play an important role, often as guardians and stewards of that mission. Two, dynamism is the new stasis. Societies need to assess the needs of professionals today, tomorrow, the next day, five minutes from now, because science is changing so rapidly, and take creative risks to stay relevant. Science is advanced by a living social system. Without cohesion and coordination, we may focus unnecessarily on competition. And lastly, opportunities abound. We have reasons to be aspirational. A practical understanding of the role of each stakeholder in our community will accelerate success in driving science forward. Investments in infrastructure are critical. We need dynamic, risk-taking leaders to lead innovation in how we function as a community and as individual parts of the whole. 
To derive these conclusions, I felt that we needed to view societies from four different perspectives, historical, social, practical, then aspirational. Let's get started with historical. Scientific societies are an important but often misunderstood part of the infrastructure of the scientific community. They sit strongly in the roots of the scientific endeavor, often serving originally as the place where scientific investigations took place. More than just a professional association, scholarly societies emerged in the 17th century. Their original mission, as Martha Ornstein described at the time, to promote, coordinate, integrate, and spread scientific knowledge in its highest expressions in the frame of cultural unity and universality. Or as Dr. Edward Hackett explored with us at our 2011 council meeting, they emerge today and continue to fulfill a role at, that is a market failure. As science emerged, a mechanism needs to exist that will allow the assimilation of the information being gained by researchers into the public forum. Scholarly organizations allow an intellectual space for the conversations among the knowledge experts to debate, communicate, and translate the new knowledge to augment society's decision-making. That market failure continues to exist today, and very dramatically, it looks like this. The biological ecosystem is a very diverse one with many stakeholders, universities, government agencies, state agencies, corporations, nonprofits, foundations, so many more. But individual professionals continue to come together and discuss matters that are of importance to their profession in science through shared research interests at their most relevant primary research society. Now there was a time when a scientific professional had a few or a few dozen organizations to choose from in coordinating their collaborative interests. In the mid 1800s, we largely saw the big medical societies emerge, the American Psychiatric Association, American Medical Association, American Dental Association. It was also when the American Association for the Advancement of Science came onto the scene. It wasn't until the turn of the century that we started to see more of those basic biological research groups start to organize, entomological, the Entomological Society of America, Botanical Society of America. Right at 1902, SICBE came on, on scene, American Genetic Association, and the American Society for Cell Biology. And then over the next 100 years, there was a boom of rapid growth as the science changed, became more diverse, more specialized, and the needs of the community became more specific particularly in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, needs of the community dictated creation of many new subcommunities to serve the needs of professionals. Today's new societies are highly specialized, serving the needs of a specific research niche, geographic population, or demographic group. For example, the International Society for Zinc Biology, or Society for Re -Re Free Radical Biology and Medicine. Overall, we have really maintained a steep growth curve over the last 160 years in this type of organization. It took the confluence of today's new technologies, strained financial climate, and shifting values to show, slow the growth individually and broadly of these organizations. Today, scholarly societies at their core are a collaborative community of individual professionals who make a personal investment to advance common goals on behalf of their individual in field of interest. It depends on individuals to support these organizations, individually, um, intellectually, socially, and financially to further their personal goals as well as those of their field. The collective contributions of these individuals are what ultimately determine the extent to which a society will be able to carry out its mission and serve its members, thus fulfilling an important role within the research community. To sustain their efforts, they have to maintain their relevance to members. Now, as I mentioned, another important aspect of societies is to take a look at it from a social perspective. In an earlier phase of my life, I used to work for a retired carbide tipped tool manufacturer. I have no idea what his professional association was, but I can guarantee that they did not spend much time as professionals worrying about whether or not people like me understood the purpose of what carbide tip tool manufacturers got together to discuss. But with great irony, he was the one who was concerned about the state of science in the public forum and allocated a significant amount of his own personal funds to create an educational resource 
actionbioscience.org that promote an understanding of bioscience literacy, of how biological research informs societal decision making. This website emerged in 1999, right at the front of the boom in web content creation. Part of what this represents is a democratization of science research, education, communication, and experimentation that has been shifting dramatically in the cultural frame. So we can't ignore the social impact role that societies and society play in science. Science is a human enterprise with a significant social mission. Scholarly societies play an important role as guardians of that mission. And we always must consider who pays for science, who benefits from science, who needs science, who practices science, who uses the processes and information of science to make decisions. Now, as we focus on this last question, I bet this group of people, it's not the first image that comes to mind. Every one of these young ladies is getting a world-class, hands-on training in, about science and complex environments. Their results of their ability to translate data accurately directly impacts whether or not they can participate in their daily activities, how they feel, or whether or not they will end up in the hospital. These scientists are all type 1 diabetics, powered up with the latest technology that provides 24 seven real time data about how their body is responding to various factors with data that informs their personal treatment decisions. Their continuous glucose monitors that they carry in their pocket provide data for them every five minutes about how their variables are changing. So it is true, science it is really for everyone everywhere. And it is part of our mission as a scientific professional workforce to understand how to advance this social mission in a culture and a climate where it's been democratized in the ways that it has. Now let's take a look at societies with a perspective that is practical. As I just mentioned, I, I articulated two very critical roles for scholarly organizations, and they often sit kind of caught between these two tensions. One, they are a business with a business model that needs to ensure the vitality of their organization through direct service to members. Two, they are a scholarly organization that plays an important role as a steward of the social mission of science. But what is a scholarly society? We use that term broadly to represent a whole community of organizations without an awareness or forethought that it's actually an incredibly diverse group of organizations that we're referencing. They're niche organizations with incredibly flexible models of how they do business. Each one is truly unique. Some look a lot like big business. Some look like small business. Some look more like a professional association. Some look like a loose coalition. Others are geared towards being an advocacy coalition. Some are social impact organizations and some are more like hobbyist groups. We did a survey where we had over 200 organizations cataloged and databased. And then we sent emails to all of those organizations and asked them to validate the information that we were able to collect about them and fill in any holes that we had. We asked the respondents to select what type of organization they represented. And we used the following definitions. A scholarly society is a membership-based organization in existence primarily to advance research in a particular scientific discipline. The second answer was a professional association a membership-based organization in existence to serve its membership by providing professional development or advocacy work for the profession. We were able to validate 139 responses and narrow the pool of results that I'm about to show you here to just those organizations who selected scholarly society, professional association, and we actually had 42 organizations that selected both. They couldn't distinguish between the two. That was 30% of our respondents. We divided those organizations, a total of 130 ended up in this summary, into eight clusters. Cluster one is organizations that have less than a thousand members, and there were 50 organizations that met that criteria. Our smallest cluster was cluster eight, with 100 to 250,000 members, and only three organizations met that criteria. Of the 130 organizations, there was a wide variety of staffing arrangements that represented them. 39.5%, the blue triangle, the blue part of this pie chart, were organizations that had zero staff at all. 28.2% had one to three staff. So almost 70% of scholarly associations have zero to three staff people. They're really understaffed. 
or they have small staffs or they don't have staff, but they continue to exist in spite of that. There was also great diversity in how their boards were compromised. Two organizations had no board members whatsoever. One had 81 to 100 board members. I can't imagine trying to wield that many board members, but the majority had 11 to 15 board members, 45 of the respondent organizations. And there was diversity in who they considered their primary target audience or category of member. 99 organizations served research scientists, 15 served educators, 24 served clinicians or practitioners, three served people who were, they didn't consider science professionals, seven served organizations, and eight chose another category. In response to the question, what is the primary role of your organization? 90% of the scholarly society respondents indicated that networking and advancing research was the reason for their existence. 86% selected journal publication, 78% selected education. Student development, public policy, serving needs of members, public programs, conservation, functioning as an honor society were all the minority answers in the survey. So to achieve the fulfillment of these roles, and as we all know, biology organizations are most likely to conduct the following core services. They publish a journal, they host an annual meeting, and they provide recognition for achievement in the discipline through an awards program. In addition to these three programs that are cornerstone to their effort, respondents to our survey on average indicated that they develop programs in another 4.8 areas and are interested in adding programs in an additional 2.3 areas. This illustrates that overall biology organizations are working in or interested in developing programs in areas well beyond their core services. And at this point, it starts to look like a professional Swiss Army knife. Much of this desire to develop programs in so many domain areas is because of an acute understanding of the pressures that are influencing how the field is growing overall and how it changes. External forces put pressure on the field and its professionals at the personal, institutional, disciplinary, and field levels. Surveys of individuals by career stage, discipline type, work setting, point to core issues that are of collective concern. As you can see, these focal points emerge across all of those work settings, career stages, and discipline types. Public appreciation of science on the left, the large right arrow, and informed decision makers on the right emerged as two of the most significant external challenges to biology. There were other, some other peaks of interest that I will share. The biomedical community was most concerned about a lack of research funding. Two-year colleges were most concerned about a failure to educate non-majors effectively, and postdoctoral scholars were most concerned about the quantity and quality of jobs in biology. This chart is a great manifestation of a true understanding of the professionals in the field of that market failure that we described earlier, and the reason why they look to societies to help fill those gaps. In addition to the external forces that push and pull on our societies, there are internal forces. Societies need to respond to the way that individuals are associating with professional organizations today. Mary Byers reviews these reasons in her book, Race for Relevance. There's increasing demands from your members on what they are going to get for their money from your organization. There's changing value across generations, changing expectations. New technologies are shifting the way people respond to different value statements. Specialization in the field changes the needs of, of how they need to network and collaborate. And time continues to be the most limited resource available today for participation in these types of organizations. So individuals have lots of organizations to choose from. Their scientific interests are becoming increasingly diverse. When given a list of over 50 different subdisciplines of science in which they would indicate what their primary research interest was, the average respondent in our survey of professionals so chose 5.34 items. And the menu of options is becoming increasingly varied. So more societies are relevant to more individuals' interests. And the most critical resources, again, are ever in ever more demand and ever shrinking supply, time and money. 
but likely the most significant driver of change among scholarly societies today is the complete upending of the revenue model that has sustained the work of these societies for decades. Universities and their libraries are losing massive amounts of funding and are cutting back on subscriptions. But at the same time, individuals are accessing what the, the core content that they really need through their digital devices, through library subscriptions, and through, co co uh, through groups like BioOne. So they are not needing to subscribe on their own in order to access the content. This is dramatically changing the flow of financial resources in the community. To illustrate this, this chart shows how our data parsed over the seven career stages, undergraduate, graduate, postdoctoral scholars, early career professionals, mid-career professionals, late career professionals, and retired. As you can see, on average, individuals are about two times more likely to join a society to receive access to a journal than they are to access the journal without uh, membership in a society. To put that into context and compare it with another variable, early career professionals are significantly more likely to join a society to receive discounted prices on products and services than they are to access the journal. So because of this decreasing interest in the journal value proposition, more options, less time to be a member, societies are shrinking, right? That would be the hypothesis. In fact, what we found was a little bit different. Of the 218 organiza organizations in our database, we were able to get multiple data points on membership trends for 74 of them. Many of these organizations don't have access to deep historical data about their membership counts, but 74 were able to tell us how their numbers had changed over five years. 46% of the organizations that responded, 33 out of 74, had actually grown more than 5% in the last five years. 38% had shrunk in the last five years, and 18% had stayed about the same. 63 organizations were able to give us a data that would let us see a 10-year trend. 44% had grown more than 5%, 41% had shrunk more than 5%, 14% had stayed about the same. Now, we also had the opportunity to look at this data from a decadal pattern. This bottom section is the 60s, up next here is the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, and then 2000 to 2010. And you'll notice something very conspicuous in this data. Of the data that we were able to capture, which there's the most in the 2000s and the least in the 60s, of course, there was the 60s, 70s, and 80s were periods defined by growth. Blue lines mean that the membership doubled or more. Purple lines mean the membership increased by 5% or more but did not double. The gold line means the membership decreased by more than 5%. It's only in the 2000s where we see this almost break even between the, how big the gold line is and how big the blue and purple line is together. Clearly, some organizations have found mechanisms to engage more members and sustain community vibrancy. Some of these organizations are small, some are large, some are organism centric, some are very specific, others are very broad. Further research would be required to identify the forces that influence how these membership trends and patterns are shifting and what is making some organizations work. But we wanted to parse the data as much as we could with what we had. So we took this data next and we, shift, we shifted it around and looked at how membership patterns varied based on the size of an organization. In this chart, the 2000s are on the left, 2000 to 2010 and 1960 to 1969 is on the right. As you can see, the 60s and 70s were periods of uh, growth, as were the 80s, the 90s, but in the 2000s, for the first time, small organizations are experiencing a sharp decline in their membership patterns. Medium range, middle size organizations, 3,700 to 20,000 members, um, largely are still growing. And then we had very little data for ex very large organizations, 35,000 members or more, up to 250,000, but those organizations appear to be growing as well. Now, the second way we analyzed this data was inspired by David Blockstein in an analysis he did on member societies in 1990. We parsed the data by discipline, and we used the same kind of reference categories that he used in his survey in the 90s. Suborganismal organizations in this past decade 
have experienced growth. Organism-based organizations have suffered largely. Plant organizations, a little bit did good, a little bad, mostly even. Ecological or environmental organizations have suffered some uh, shrinking over the past decade. Agricultural, water, food supply, a little bit, a few went up, a few went down. Medical professional, a little bit up, a little bit down. What's really telling in this piece of research is that medical or health research organizations have experienced tremendous boom over the last decade. So we identified in our research two really compelling reasons to motivate people to join a scholarly society. One of them is to meet people in person. This red line represents the ratio of people joining a society in order to attend the scientific meeting or annual meeting. Uh, an average would be about five across all the career stages, but postdocs, there are eight times more likely to join a society to go to the meeting. The yellow line represents opportunities to meet others with common interests face to face. They're three times more likely to join a society to meet others face to face than to not join a society. That's a stronger value proposition than journal publication, uh, access to journals. What they are not coming to societies to do is to participate in online networks. Less than one was the uh, ratio of people who joined a society in order to access online networks. And the second value proposition is professional, a feeling of professional responsibility. To be a part of my professional community ranks fairly highly. About four people are about four and a half times more likely overall to join a society just out of that desire to be part of their professional community than to not join a society. That's something technology cannot replace. The green line is to serve a leadership role in my profession. That's about two, two and a half times. And the yellow line is to advance the policy agendas of my profession. We asked an open-ended question about what members like from their societies currently. This red bar here is the resources and information that their society provides. This nice, great, bright green line is networking and collaborations. I think you're probably seeing the same pattern I am. The blue line is career advancement opportunities. And I really like this light blue teal line here. Those are specific traits of individual societies. A lot of societies become like professional home away from, homes away from home for people. And that role is really important in its own right. We asked members what they'd like to see more of or done better by their society organizations. About 60% of them said that they want to see their society focus on what it is they do as a core service for their members and make that better. Their meetings, career advancement opportunities, their journal. The yellow bar is about 10% across the board. That's what the society does in service to the profession and field, like public policy, formal and informal education, collaboration and community. The green line is that people would like to see a change in how the society is run or managed. The teal line is nothing. They didn't know, they didn't have a response. And that little sliver of blue at the top is stuff that you guys have no control over whatsoever. So in order to increase our organizational capacities, we need to think about what members want, which is improving networking for and among members in person, improve meetings and conferences, career assistance and professional development. And what societies need to be vibrant is to be really relevant to their members. I mean incredibly relevant to their members because professionals are most likely to join only one to three organizations. They're being incredibly choosy in how they're deciding to spend their time and resources to support the profession. I believe that th that gives scholarly organizations every right to focus on their hedgehog. For those of you who have read Jim Collins' Good to Great, you may be familiar with the hedgehog concept, but for those of you who aren't, a good org Jim Collins distinguishes a good organization from a great organization by their ability to be focused on the objectives they're aiming to achieve. If an organization has a really solid hedgehog concept where they understand the nexus of what they're deeply passionate about, what they can be the very best in the world at, and what drives their economic engine, they're much more likely to be a great organization and be successful in their mission and endeavor. So my final perspective on which I wanted to view societies was aspirational, but I'm gonna start with a pessimistic quote. 
Bruce Alberts and his colleagues published in PNAS in 2014. By many measures, the biological and medical sciences are in a golden age. That fact, which we celebrate, makes it all the more difficult to acknowledge that the current system contains systemic flaws that are threatening its future. These new challenges acquire a special urgency in the biological sciences. Jim Collins, not the one who wrote Good to Great, but the one who's on the board at American Institute of Biological Sciences, affirms that in our very diverse subdisciplinary and interdisciplinary uh, community, we have created a highly fragmented and complex professional landscape. So what do we do about it? How are individuals and organizations supposed to respond to these issues and these forces? We know that change needs to happen, but it's very overwhelming. Individuals know, biology serving organizations know, this research affirms that we're worried about public appreciation, about informed decision makers, about changes in practice, but we just genuinely have no idea where to start. And this is where the aspiration starts to come in. Dynamism is the new stasis. Throughout our research, we found that almost everything surrounding our pursuit of our goals is changing. The practice of science is changing. Educational requirements and standards are changing. Jobs are changing. Job training and preparation needs to change. Society is changing. Therefore, in a climate where everything is changing, we're provided so many chances to rewrite the rule book. And the key word here is together. Opportunities abound. The questions asked by scientists today are increasingly large and unbounded by geographic, cultural, or disciplinary constraints. How we do our science, how we organize as scientists to share research and solve problems, and how we transfer knowledge to society to help re resolve complex questions are all fundamentally changing. This shifts, or should be, or can be, driving huge transformations in practice in the way we work as scholars, educators, advocates, and communicators, but how? So I've added up a roll up our sleeves perspective. We created this poster back in 2014 to summarize the leadership in biology research that we did. With such dramatic shifts in both science and society, opportunities are abundant. Answers to exciting new questions at the frontiers of the life sciences will require robust cross-disciplinary teams to answer them. People who think about living systems realize that these challenges are full of multifaceted, evolved, unscripted challenges. To seize these opportunities, we might reconsider our professional practices through asking questions that are bound together with a set of results in mind. How might we reconsider how we, we, the research community, reinforce, recognize, and promote professionals for their contributions. How we organize research and educational units and professional teams. How we educate students to be prepared to engage in this new multidisciplinary world of modern biology. How we assess what diverse skills and perspectives are required to advance science. And how we train the diverse community of professionals that communicate science to the public. The change we describe requires a collective impact and a cultural change in how we function as a professional community. So when I said we're focused on a core group of outcomes together, we're able to look at ensuring a dynamic and thriving science, empowering an informed citizenry, informing policy through effective relationships with policymakers, and building an effective and diverse professional community. And we're able to reconsider how we might do everything that we do. These sound like really big, big problems. Mammoth starting points. So I'm going to let you in on the secret phrase that top innovators use at Google, Facebook, and IDEO. They jumpstart the process of innovation by focusing on three words, how might we? Some of the most successful companies in business today are known for tackling creative challenges by first asking, how might we improve X? Or completely reimagine Y? or find a new way to accomplish Z. In the how might we mindset, every problem is an opportunity for design. By framing your challenge as a how might we question, you set yourself up for an entirely innovative and new solution. So I'm going to ask us in the biology and ecosystem, those four challenge themes I just highlighted that emerged through our exploratory conversations, they're ones that are shared broadly by all of us in all of our subdisciplinary communities. 
the needs of the biological sciences require that a broad view be maintained and communicated effectively. Common outcomes be shared and success be measured through a coordinated cooperative leadership to seize the opportunities available to us. How might we, life scientists, stimulate leadership to create a stronger, more cooperative community? Life science research again today is unlimited by borders. How do we promote robust basic research alongside cooperative, innovative, creative new models in which we embrace the transdisciplinary, transdisciplinary new nature of science? Beyond developing those specific skill sets, how do we recognize and prepare all types of professional scientists to advance science through communication and advocacy of public interfaces to rapidly embrace the opportunities of today and tomorrow's science? And how can we be fearless about trying new tactics to reach our desired outcomes? How might we reduce barriers to ensure opportunities for innovation at the interfaces, white spaces, and gateways of tomorrow's science? And nearly every leader we interviewed through our exploratory interviews and um, considered the public to be the most significant stakeholder in our science. They expressed concern about the risks that emerge when the public experiences this new democratized science where they can use a fold scope as a microscope in their garage or uh, print with 3D printers or DIY create things that were unimaginable just 10 years ago. There is a critical need for the public to understand the process and nature of science. The relationship with the public has to be built on the trust and the power of how the processes of science, how we provide reliable information that makes decision making a little better, and to trust the risks and um, advisories that we put out about how to do it well. How do we improve communication with our most valuable stakeholders to ensure that science benefits society and that the public supports science? How might we empower the public with the tools and information of science to instur, ensure a strong social interrelationship? The elephant in the room is the need for us to change our culture. And cultural change is not easy. It requires an elephant-sized investment in intangibles, outcomes that we can't touch or feel. Investments in time, money, leadership, humility, relentless pursuit of our goals. So the Scholarly Society of 2015, I want to affirm that you are a rich and vital part of the scientific endeavor. You're, you serve an intended mission well, and you have a very flexible model that allows you to be innovative and entrepreneurial and about how you do your business and about how you achieve your mission. But I also wanna caution you that attempting to be everything for everyone virtually guarantees organizational ineffectiveness. That doesn't diminish the two roles that you serve. We need you to serve your members and serve them really well. And we also need you to serve science and society and be great stewards of science out to the public. You can focus on your hedgehog. Create that one really awesome idea that really drives your business engine and be careful of being a fox, the alternative, which chases many little ideas. The hedgehog is awesome. It helps makes it really clear what you count as success. It connects your revenue model directly <clears throat> to your mission so that investing in your model also builds your mission and it clearly distinguishes the organization's role as a cooperative entity in a collaborative community rather than a competitive entity in a highly competitive environment. I have three very seemingly simple but very difficult recommendations. Each requires massive cultural shifts in how we think about a scholarly society does business today. Step one, concentrate your research. Be rapid observers of how the practice of your niche of science is changing and be in front of that change and make it easy for your professionals to adapt. Focus on your hedgehog concept. Two, purposefully abandon things that are mediocre. Those legacy programs, those things where you're not excelling, those things where you're not quite sure, but it's the good idea, but I don't know, let them go. And three, participate in a collaborative community of change. 
Kanya and Kramer put out a really important paper in the standards, uh, Stanford Social Innovation Review in 2011 called Collective Impact. It started a movement. It's really shifting how we achieve social impact in many different social sectors. <clears throat> Rather than trying to do everything ourselves in our own individual way, participate in creating a common agenda, shared measurement systems, mutually reinforcing activities, continuous communication, and backbone support organizations. And then follow through as an organization that supports the creation of success in those results. That second role of science and society, it's not one that you scholarly societies own yourselves. It relies on all of the stakeholders in our science to be invested in being agents of change required in our sector. Funders, they have to make investment in infrastructure and backbone support. Academic institutions need to make change. Government agencies and state agencies need to change. It's not on scholarly societies alone to solve those problems themselves. Now there are some really cool cultural shifts taking place and I'm just gonna highlight a couple things quickly. One, there's a growing profession of solution seekers. They've been out there for a long time but it's really catapulting right now. It's a world of social entrepreneurs. Social entrepreneurs adopt a mission to create and sustain social value. They recognize and relentlessly pursue new opportunities to serve that mission. Engage in a process of continuous innovation, adaptation, and learning. They act boldly without being limited to resources currently at hand, and they exhibit a heightened sense of accountability to the constituencies they serve. Social entrepreneurs are redefining the landscape of how social impact is achieved and how social innovation can happen. And many of them start with design thinking. The incredible thing about design thinking is it's very human-centered. It starts with your audience and then stems out to what your organization can do to serve them with a very acute awareness of what their needs are. We, I, Tom, Tim Brown, he's a CEO and president of IDEO, uh, says, we are at a critical point where rapid change is forcing us to look not just to new ways of solving problems, but to identify new problems to solve. I think that's a really interesting quote about design thinking. And the second influence that I wanna share with you uh, was published in the Harvard Business Review in December 2014. And it speaks about old power versus new power. And I think this is just super apropos to how people organize and get things done today. Old power works like a currency. It's held by a few. Once gained, it is jealously guarded and the powerful have a substantial store of it to spend. It is closed, inaccessible, and leader-driven. It downloads and it captures. New power operates differently, like a current. It's made by many. It is open, participatory, and peer-driven. It uploads and it distributes. This really describes our society today and how our young early career professionals, what their mindset is powered toward. Like water or electricity, it's most forceful when it surges. The goal with new power is not to hoard it, but to channel it. New power gains its force from people's growing capacity and desire to go far beyond passive consumption of ideas and goods, to sharing other people's contents and ideas, and then to remixing that content to work with your community and to accelerate your community to funding, to endorsing new ideas that are exciting with money or crowdsourcing, and then to producing, creating, or delivering content or assets within your own communities. I think this scale of participation is particularly relevant for how societies can participate as entities in collective impact. So in thinking about how might we be prepared to rapidly respond to the changes in our science, grow the capacity of our community to have affect change and create impact, build the investment and in infrastructure for collective impact, welcome entrepreneurship and thinking outside of the box to reach our social outcomes. I think we really need to encourage and promote entrepreneurial thinking that helps us color outside of the lines. Outside of our comfort zone is where the magic is going to happen. So as I said in the beginning, I wanted to leave you with three takeaway messages. Number one, scholarly societies are a rich and vital part of the scientific enterprise. They are a business that requires a thriving business model to serve individual professionals first. It's okay to pursue your hedgehog concept, but in the scientific ecosystem, remember that your organizations are partners in fulfilling a social mission as well. 
Number two, dynamism is the new stasis. Societies need to assess the needs of professionals today and take creative risks to stay relevant. Science is advanced by living social system. It's changing. People are changing. There's much we can learn from one another in a cooperative spirit. And three, opportunities abound. We have reason to be aspirational. A practical understanding of the role of each stakeholder in our community will accelerate success in driving science forward. Individually, we're not responsible to pursue every opportunity and resolve every solution, but collectively we must. Investments in infrastructure are critical. We need dynamic, risk-taking leaders to lead innovation in how we function as a community and as individuals that are part of a whole. I leave you with a message from Joe Travis in our Opportunities Abound paper. He asks, can the life sciences community summon the courage and political will to transform our complex and compounded set of challenges, starting with transforming the culture to one that values and cultivates leadership? We at AABS believe that the life sciences professional community can. More than that, we believe that we must. And that's all I have for you today. Thank you. I'm open to questions. Yes, yeah, so if anybody has any questions, you can go ahead and type it in the chat feature, and I will go ahead and relay it to Sherry. Um, I have a question, Sherry. I would, okay. like to know, I would like to know if anyone has specific examples of societies increasing the revenue by doing innovative things, particularly related to publications. So, um, I'm not aware of any examples of that but I think it would be great to pursue those examples. I know that there's a lot of societies that are making new decisions in how they are publishing their journal. Uh, Dr. Tim Beardsley was supposed to be on this line. Perhaps he is aware of some of those changes that might be taking place. Um, Oxford University Press is another organization that's right at the front edges of publication changes. So uh, I can pursue specific examples and report back to the group of registrants. Thanks. He was on the call, but I think he had to jump off. Okay. Um, and yes, uh, somebody's asking if this will be, if the, we'll be sharing the recording presentation. We will be, this will be available to everybody, um, I'm hoping by Monday at the latest. Uh, my goal is obviously tomorrow, but just to make sure. <laughs> give, give me a little time to get it edited and put online. But once we do have it available, we will be emailing everybody who registered for the webinar um, and we'll give you a link on how to access it. Any additional questions? Well, I thank everybody for hanging in there for the full hour. And um, I hope we, you enjoyed We do have a question. Um, okay. The question was just non-publication models, I guess, um, regarding the, the past question. Um, any specific um, examples of societies increasing revenue by doing innovative things, maybe not regarding publication, I'm assuming that's the question. So um, I've seen societies experimenting with different um, ways to approach their meetings. I know that ESA has done some really cool things with fundraising and in their SEEDS program through allowing younger career professionals to take over the model and find new ways to build revenue. I've also seen uh, some interesting new collaborations between the Entomological Society and the Tri-Soil Societies, um, focusing on collaboration as part of their meetings. So I think a lot of experimentation is taking place right now. It's a little early to tell what the results are going to be, but uh, different combinations of organizations are coming together to try new things. Um, younger society members are experimenting with different ideas and social media. Um, and conferences are becoming more popular. So there's a lot of experimentation taking place and I think it would be worthwhile to continue this line of study and to find those bright spots of where people are trying things that's really resonating among professionals today. Diane, are there any further questions? Sorry, I muted myself. I was talking <laughs> to myself. I did have a private uh, message sent to me. Somebody requested um, a list of some of the, the publications you referenced. 
Okay. Awesome. I'd be happy to send a list of references to all the publications in the email that we send out, the follow-up email. I can also, I can also include it in the, in the, um, on the page for the webinar. For okay. That, if you want, whichever is easier. And I do want to follow up and say that our um, research was really geared towards understanding the general trends and patterns and how things have changed. And we haven't taken that next step to really pursue what experimentation is looking like today and what people are trying that's new. And I, that's something I'd really like to open up the box on and start investigating. So if others would like to see that and see another webinar where we can highlight what different kinds of programs people are doing, continue that conversation, please send an affirmation that that would be of interest to you. It'll be something then that we can pursue. Great. I do have a couple questions. Um, okay. Do we see many societies in the natural sciences field able to balance professional and amateur membership, offering something to both groups? Um, usually they cater more towards one or the other. Uh, some societies have just made the decision to be more about uh, being a hobbyist group as opposed to a professional association. The Dragonfly Association is one of those such organizations, and you saw that it had experienced quite a bit of growth. Um, I think you can balance the two effectively. I think that as long as there's a core of professionals who want to continue to advance their mission with like-minded individuals, um, you may not have a huge professional audience, but serving two secondary audiences that are really interconnected or two dual audiences that are really interconnected can be very effective as a novel business model. Great. Um, have you... Have you seen um, have you seen examples of societies with similar membership and goals merge to achieve to better achieve objectives? I've seen them try, and this is something that I find really interesting. I know of two separate uh, types of groups where they have bifurcated into several different organizations, but they all specialize in a very similar kind of realm. And both of those little pods, I'll call them. Um, have made a significant effort to try and pull themselves back together and have had a very difficult time getting through the governance challenges, the identity challenges, the, um, the, the whatever divided them, it's big to overcome. So I would love to report examples of where societies have said, hey, we're all kind of trying to serve the same people. Let's bring it all back together and, and create a, a more cohesive unit. I think they'd be more successful that way, um, but they've continued to serve as separate entities. And I will say it's, it appears anecdotally that the societies that are thriving today are the ones that are more broad in their mission. I know the Society of Integrative and Comparative Biology has been increasing year over year rise in membership. Um, cell biology and molecular biology organizations are both growing right now. So um, those that are a little more flexible in their definition and allow a home for more types of people are the ones that are seeing more success. Okay. Have you uh, had any discussion on how to help federal scientists be more active in their societies? It is such a fantastic question. Um, whoever asked that question, if you could email me, I would love to talk to you because through this research, we found that largely scholarly societies are populated by academic scientists in university and educational settings. And I think there's a really important need to make sure that professionals in other settings are participating in these leadership dialogues. And I would love to explore that topic with you more. Uh, overwhelmingly, scholarly societies are constituted by academic professionals. And there's a whole slew of other scientists who need to be participating in these leadership conversations and, and aren't because they haven't found a home in these organizations. Okay, and um, what, what, did, what did you find as the most pressing challenging challenges facing societies today? So um, there's three. Uh, one of them is membership, either declining or diversifying or maintaining membership. So there's a whole different bunch of ways around the word membership that people expressed concerns and not knowing how to serve their membership the best. The second was in funding. With the change in the journal publication practice, um, the funding models are shifting dramatically and it's organizations are having a hard time redefining the value proposition in a way that sustains membership. Fortunately, annual meetings continue to be a mainstay in serving individuals. Um, three was publications. 
uh, organizations are having a really hard time reconciling how to change their publication model without sacrificing their revenue line. So they're um, playing with a lot of different options, not sure which way to move. Uh, and it's undermining how we run the risk of undermining how the integrity of the research that we're publishing by not maintaining that role as stewards of the good content in our, in our field. Great. Thank you. I think that's all the questions we have. So just Great. want to thank Sherry very much for um, hosting this call today. And again, if uh, you just look out for that email from us, if you need to reach Sherry for anything, feel free to email her at membership at AIBS.org or her personal, which is S Potter at <laughs> AIBS.org. Um, or you can email me, which most of you should have my email address since I've emailed most of you and I will forward it to Sherry. Um, again, thanks again. And we hope to see you next month at our next meeting, next webinar. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us. I appreciate it. Hope you have a great day.